you come to conference? I have come to meet with old friends and then to interact with them. For years and years, we come every year, and it just seems like a tradition that we come. Well, but just to learn how the church operates on a worldwide basis. Last year, I went to Graceland, and I'm back home now, and I'd never been to conference, so I figured this would be a good opportunity to see conference and see old friends. I come to the soul field with the doctrinal uh, procedures and receive all that the conference has so that I go back to share with my people and that helps in the growth of the work in Nigeria. I've just always come to conference every time I've had the opportunity. The church is very important to me and I just like to know what's going on. Welcome to Perspectives of the 1984 World Conference, a special edition of Restoration Today and Tomorrow. I'm Jill Jensen with Terry Reed and Susan Cavanaugh, your hosts for this program. The festive atmosphere that surrounds the World Conference experience generates not only a sense of excitement and anticipation, but it also creates a unique environment for rich fellowship and sharing together. This year's conference has been all that and more. It's been worshipful, it's been spirit-filled, it's literally been history in the making. That's right, Terry. President Wallace B. Smith brought forth to the conference an inspired document that represents a milestone in the life of the church. Our program will take a close look at that landmark document, including a special visit with President Smith. Perspectives is one hour long, divided into two parts. In part one, in addition to the inspired document, we'll have a glimpse of the International Leaders Assembly and take a close look at one of the familiar perspectives of conference. Conference is a tradition. From our very beginning of the Restoration Movement, we have met together in assembly to deliberate issues concerning the church and its mission. There's a spirit at conference. You can see it in the people's faces, hear it in their singing, feel it as they're gathering. From conference to conference, many things change. New policy is legislated, new ways to hear and be heard on the delegate floor are implemented. Even church leadership personnel changes are made. But the spirit and purpose of conference remains the same. As delegates and visitors from around the world assemble to direct the church, the traditions of conference unfold. Since 1927, conference has convened at the center place in Independence. The auditorium is a symbol of that tradition. Many reunions take place as delegates register in the lower hall or meet in the lunch lines outside the Laurel Club. Graceland alumni reminisce and people talk about the coming week. Laughing and hugging are a part of the reunion and fellowship of World Conference. The renewing or making of new friendships carries throughout the week as people from different countries learn to communicate with one another. This is the traditional spirit of conference. Conference is a memory-making experience. For me, my most familiar memories are sitting high in the balcony between my two parents, overwhelmed by the sound of the voices singing and the processional of flags as each country where the church is established was honored. The singing of hymns and the processional of flags is still an integral part of the conference. Historically, the first Sunday is a unifying day as the body shares in the morning communion services and opening business session. There is an electricity in the air generated by an anticipation for the coming week. For many, it's their first time at conference, and the responsibility of being a delegate adds to the excitement. As expected, the legislative business evokes disagreement, but the spirit of love and fellowship inherent in conference maintains a harmony. Worship is a foremost element of conference. Traditionally, every meeting together is begun or ended with prayer and song, be it a formal worship service, business session, or a time of entertainment. It's customary for the President Prophet to preach the opening evening worship. President Smith spoke on the theme, Draw Near with a True Heart, followed later in the week by a sermon from the presiding bishop, Francis E. Hansen. Presiding Patriarch Dwayne E. Cooey also provided preaching ministry. This conference's worship services were a blending of old and new. In addition to the sermons, the Council of Twelve presented a service of outreach with gospel singing, a speech choir, and a hymn of commitment led by representatives from 32 countries where the church is established. 
An awareness of being a world church was prevalent during the worship services as members from many countries shared in their native tongue. The ordination services held Thursday morning and Friday evening reminded the conference of the church's purpose and mission. One special tradition of conference is the tribute to retired appointees. Twelve appointees and their companions were honored during Saturday's business session. That evening, the Council of Twelve and Quorum of Seventies presented an evangelistic worship service with testimonies on the outreach of the Church into Haiti and the Dominican Republic. The element of worship was present in other services held in local congregations where ministry was directed toward intergenerational groups. World Conference regularly plans activities and services for their youth. This conference was highlighted by a youth dialogue session with Everett Graffio and Morris Draper. Its purpose was to help the youth better understand the issues of conference. True to tradition, the closing worship ceremony was the climax of conference. Again present were the hugs and laughter, but also the sadness from saying goodbye. The traditions of conference are endless, and there are new traditions being made as the Church expands its outreach. Susan attended a new addition to conference that has become a tradition. For the second time in the history of the Church, World Church members met together for an International Leaders' Assembly. The Church has opened more new non-Anglo-American jurisdictions in the last 20 to 25 years than it has in its entire 154-year-old history. To meet the needs of the growing International Church, leaders constructed the more inclusive International Leaders' Assembly to replace the established International Women's Forum that normally convened the week before World Conference. ILA Week was a major success in 1982, and this year it continued its reputation by transcending cultural boundaries and uniting International Church members in fellowship and worship. It presented an opportunity to share ideas on the missional calling of international representatives. This year's theme for ILA was the Living Christ. Members registered and reunited, and on Tuesday began the week with a special worship service that opened with a processional of church members from 27 different countries. Translators were on hand to make sure everyone was able to understand the messages shared. Hiroshi Matsushita of Tokyo, Japan, talked about his personal responsibility as a translator. The delegates of Japan really enjoy to learn about the love of God and what we are learning, for instance, the image of God and so on, very uh, meaningfully. So I think uh, even uh, as we talk about God and everything like uh, those terminologies in foreign language, but. Uh, I think translation works okay, and uh, uh, the delegates understand it very well, so, so I think uh, everything works okay. As the opening worship service continued, several representatives ceremoniously placed personalized crosses, made by their church members at home, into a basket. That basket stood for the formation of a worship center. Each church member spoke in their native language, saying, this cross symbolizes the work of our people and Christ in our country. We hope to share with you and also take part in your mission. Individually, we are weak, but together we will be stronger. Messages were not confined to the spoken word. The living Christ was exemplified through every action in the service. International leaders examined the image of God in all facets of the world. Plenary sessions were held during two mornings, to bring forth the reality of God in our present world and our responsibility to that reality. World Church members responded to an outline of specific Christian stewardship purposes. This year's organizers of the International Leaders' Assembly focused on what it really means to share the gospel in other parts of the world, how there are culturally specific needs in some ministries. In some areas of the world, the physical needs of people have to be administered to before successfully reaching them spiritually. ILA participants were able to discuss and respond to Christian issues following numerous presentations highlighting examples of the Church's successful international programs. Allie Gunlock looked forward to sharing the information with her people. I really feel God's love 
through every person here. And the program we've been having really teach me a lot uh, that, will, that I can apply to my own church back in Taiwan, that how to deal with my church members there to teach them um, what this living Christ really is. The image of God was reflected in the fellowship that developed between world leaders. To some, that image was a unique part of ILA. And, and I think that's one of the neat things about it, that there is no one specific image of God, but that everyone that's participating, uh, that we were all made in the image of God and the multiplicity of cultures, you know, in, in, in a larger picture, does represent the images of God. And so that's what's neat about it, that it's not Anglo-Saxon or it's not Orient. It's, it's a combination of all the various cultures wrapped up together that makes it exciting and, uh, and something very believable. International leaders were given the opportunity to confer with world church leaders who work primarily at headquarters. ILA also acted as a preparatory event to conference for world leaders. During the last afternoon, world conference issues were scrutinized. By bringing up conference legislation during ILA, international leaders gain a better understanding of issues and ultimately have greater confidence in their subsequent involvement in conference. The unity of the intercultural church members was witnessed during the final worship service as each person prepared to take the living Christ back to their own countries. This was suggested in the exchange of crosses between international representatives. One person would take away the cross which was originally brought by another. The exchange prompted contemplation and tears. Each person shared the message with their partner. The Christ in me you carry with you now, and I carry yours. In such a way, everyone became a carrier of the living Christ. As ILA focused on the living Christ, the World Conference prepared to explore the theme, Invite All to Come to Christ. This theme was brought sharply into focus when President Smith submitted an inspired document to the Council's orders, quorums, and delegates. April 6, 1984, the Church's 154th birthday. No special attention was to be given to this day, though, especially nothing like the same day four years ago when the Church celebrated its historic sesquicentennial anniversary. But the passing of birthday number 154 will long be remembered in the life of the Church as an historic milestone of a different kind. In the most far-reaching inspired document submitted to the Church in many years, President Wallace B. Smith presented divine direction to the Church concerning the temple and the priesthood. The Revelation speaks specifically about the ministries to be provided in the temple and calls for the work on it to go forward. The most sensitive issue addressed by the document pertains to priesthood. The Divine Council affirms the gifts of all and calls for a priesthood made up of those with an abiding faith and a great devotion, including women. This historic guidance to the Church, now to be included in the Doctrine and Covenants as Section 156, brought varied responses from delegates and visitors. But virtually all of those we talked with expressed continued support of the Church in the future. But I felt when the document was actually being read, a really fine spirit within me, especially the temple absolutely thrilled me. And that same spirit continued with me throughout the revelation. I never doubt about this document because I know that it's coming from God. And I know that the president is the representative of God. And, and I never doubt about that. Oh, at the present time, I. Uh feel a little bit of discomfort, but also that I can see that uh, there's a lot of work now that needs to be done in, uh, in ways of, of uh, touching people's lives that has been hurt, that uh, we've got a great job ahead of us, 
in the respect that uh, we can continue to love and share this wonderful gospel that we know that it is true in the response that all of us are still close united together. I believe the document to be uh, divinely inspired. I do not believe our God to be a respecter of persons. Uh, from my position, uh, as you can see by my skin color, it's, it's a position of uniqueness and a position where I uh, feel that I've been uh, made sensitive to many issues that many other people uh, kind of overlook. And uh, I believe that it, it's time for us to face up to the fact that uh, God loves all people equally well. I think that it can bring families together. Husbands and wives can minister together and understand what is happening. I do not see it as anything that should be disruptive for the family, but it will become a, an opportunity for joint dedication and a real commitment. I, I think it has all kinds of potential for the church and for families and for the world, really. I have no qualms about ordination of women. I think that's uh, if, why. Sure, I remember I built the Kirkland Temple, the ladies uh, donated their fine china and stuff, and this time I think it's going to be their their talents and their resources that are that they're going to put into it. And I think it's uh, all part of the plan that uh, God has for us. The subject of ordaining women is very controversial, but personally, I feel that it's it's a good idea because um, I think many women can bring ministry to others, not that men can't, but in other ways. I see the gifts of all people as something that are precious. And I feel that the more that we can do to utilize and acknowledge those gifts and empower those gifts to serve uh, Christ, the, the blessing will be ours because of that. I'm not sure yet exactly how I'm feeling. I need time myself to be alone with my God. We talked with President Smith and the First Presidency to further explore the directives of the new revelation. We appreciate the willingness of each of you to join us so soon after such a long week. Uh, and first of all, just how are you feeling about all the whole experience of the conference? I feel very good, a little tired, but otherwise very positive about the things that happened at conference and the people who I have talked to have expressed to me how they were feeling. Certainly, for the most part, seem to be feeling very affirmative, very uplifted uh, coming out of the, the week of conference. Uh, we had a, a lot on our plate, so to speak, and we had to deal with a lot of things, but I thought people dealt with them very responsibly. Terry, I was surprised at how much participation level was up. The hearing committees were busy the whole time. Every item on the agenda and in the pre-legislative sessions, more people were anxious to talk than we had time for, and fewer items were referred to the First Presidency than in my memory of any conference. We only have about four things that the conference did not make a decision about. We're going to focus in these next few minutes on the inspired document, which is now Revelation and Section 156 in the Doctrine and Covenants. There's a recurring theme of reconciliation in the document. Uh, it's evidenced by some, some quotes in relation to the temple that it will be a place for reconciliation and healing of the spirit in, in the direction for ministerial support to those burdened with uncertainty and misunderstanding that's called for tenderness of feeling. Can you underscore and maybe expound on that theme of reconciliation? What, what I see as being uh, uppermost in that message is that we are concerned, of course, about those within the church as well as those beyond the church who are needing to feel that kind of reconciling spirit, uh, the feeling that uh, we are indeed anxious to be seen as a people uh, willing to work at the cause of peace. Now, just how that's going to be expressed, I think we still need to, to be continuing to work on, but certainly I think that is the, the feeling that, uh, that I'm getting and that people are picking up about that reconciling spirit. Um, the temple, of course, is a focus for that, but it certainly is not different in kind from the kinds of things that we are going to be calling on uh, to have happening 
in every congregation, every place where the church is a force in a community or in an area, we're going to try to hold up that kind of, of focus. So uh, we're seeing the temple as simply being representative of the kind of ministries that uh, we're wanting to focus on throughout the church to the extent that the instructions in the document itself uh, call for an adjustment in the thinking of some people within the church, certainly those same kinds of reconciling ministries will be called upon to, uh, to bring those people along, to help them deal with some of the feelings that they're having about uh, something which is so basic to their understanding of the church. So I think all of those aspects of reconciling ministry will be called into play as we seek to live out the instructions of that um, revelatory statement. You alluded to peace, and <clears throat> in the document, the council uh, is that the temple should be dedicated to the pursuit of peace. What, um, what do you think that says, and what, do you, what does it offer to the world today in light of the, the given situation in our societies? Because our temple ministries would be available to the public generally, they are not uniquely or solely for Latter-day Saints, of course. And we see the ministry of reconciliation being a ministry which would include all those efforts toward peace in all forms of uh, interpersonal relationships, individual to individual, for example, and uh, could very well be the ministry that would bring persons in personal conflict together for reconciliation. We would expect that that ministry, while perhaps having some major focus in the temple per se, would be nevertheless a basic ministry of the church so that the quality of ministry that we might consider to be a temple ministry is something that the entire church and all of its congregations will participate in. Now the same quality of ministry would also be engaged in reconciling persons to God and thus to the church. In addition to that, it would be a matter of reconciling perhaps in some communities disparate elements within the community. For example, the temple itself could well be a place where certain forms of debate or uh, discussion, symposiums, lectures, could well take place that would uh, be an attempt at uh, ministry toward reconciling the various uh, uh, divisive attitudes in the community at large. With regard to the independence area, we're talking perhaps about uh, the greater Kansas City metropolitan area and some things there, but more importantly, national and international concerns would be appropriate items for the agenda of such uh, symposia or uh, such uh, meetings and conferences and uh, lectures and so on. In addition, I would also think that uh, the uh, temple would provide what you might call a, a world church pulpit of ministry that would, in essence, uh, sound certain keynotes for the church at large and uh, to which the various congregations of the church might well look for some of the directions and some of the ministries that they may wish also to engage in. I think those could be quite significant. Now, involved in all of this, in addition to what might be considered public ministry, would be the more private counseling ministry that would help to heal differences and to reconcile persons. And we would see this as being very important and related there. Now, in addition to all of that, the Temple School, which has been with us now for some years and which already has acquired a, a major status in the structures and ministries of the church in leadership training and preparation, this will also be very important in extending these temple ministries throughout the church and not alone focused in independence and in the temple per se. The document also calls for continuation of uh, the work in the temple at an accelerated rate. Uh, what steps will be taken in response to that direction? The document is very helpful to us in describing general functions of ministry. Brother Tyrese talked about many of those. Another step to take is how will we specifically plan for those functions to be carried out in what we might call daily or weekly programs and how will those programs which center at the temple 
also relate to the congregational life and the pastoral units throughout the church because we would not want to feel that things can happen only in the temple. Those ought to be able to be replicated in the congregations of our people. That's a first step. A second step has to do with updating the architectural work which was completed in 1974 for a master plan of the auditorium, stone church, temple site area. It has to do with where streets will be and how buildings will face. We need to take a look at that again. That's 10 years old. And we are now ready to take the steps, if we work out the functions of the temple, to architectural planning of the building or buildings that would make up the complex. But in those last 10 years, while well, it would appear outwardly that very little was taking place, we have been able to consolidate the property purchases for the temple site area and protection around the temple. And actually several important steps have been taken, which we, for reasons of land values, we've not given very much publicity. Finally, we need to uh, take the steps to bring in the resources necessary to both build and operate the building. And that will be a significant step in that fundraising activity, the gathering of the surplus needs to take place. Appreciate your willingness to share some of those uh, steps with us. Um, <clears throat> the document, of course, also calls for the uh, uh, opening of the priesthood uh, to include women and the gifts, recognizing the gifts of women. And an important word that's used is deliberateness in, in the ordaining of women. And it calls for instructions and guidelines to be prepared by the spiritual authorities of the church. Can you share a little about how that will happen and even the basis for, those, for that spiritual guidance? Yes, what we were most interested in trying to convey all week uh, to the people as this came under discussion was the idea that we are in no way wanting to rush into a whole series of ordinations. Uh, this would be true uh, if we had introduced any new kind of instruction uh, for priesthood and ordination, and certainly it's uh, true in this instance. Uh, because it does represent a departure for us and introduces a new element into our priesthood structure, we feel that it is going to be important for guidelines to be developed and uh, even uh, specific instructions uh, sent out to administrative um, officers so that they will know how to proceed. We can uh, envision that in some places uh, there will be some people who are very eager to implement the new directions. There will be some other places where uh, they will feel that uh, a great deal of time and a great deal of understanding and education will need to take place before these kinds of instructions can be uh, implemented. And we are wanting to say and will be saying very shortly um, uh, as soon as we can get out uh, some kind of instruction or, or directive to the field, that um, both of those need to be uh, dealt with very carefully. We uh, do not want people rushing to, to um, approve a large number of ordinations until we have defined what uh, appropriate roles are, uh, set up some guidelines for how uh, priesthood will function together when there are de different sexes involved. Uh, at the same time, we want to let certain areas know that um, uh, there is no imperative to rush to ordain persons, and it may be a number of years before the general level of understanding of the people will allow that. You know, one of the basic principles of priesthood is acceptability by those receiving that priesthood ministry. And there would be very little point in ordaining persons to priesthood responsibilities where their ministry is not going to be received. So we want that to be very clear to the people that, that uh, this will need to be done with all of those things 
very carefully in mind. This step uh, for the church has already received considerable amount of attention in the press and I would imagine uh, from people without the church. Uh, it would seem even though there are many churches who presently ordain women that uh, a step such as this on our part might uh, attract some inquiries, uh, people that might be interested in, in a church that affirms uh, the gifts of all and, and recognizes that in its priesthood. What effect do you think that this step will have on the Faith to Grow program, on our evangelistic thrust? Well, Terry, the, there is a difference between other churches which have opened their seminaries and thus provided ordination for women who became professionally qualified in that category and our point of view about priesthood because we're talking about a membership priesthood and we are just expanding the possibilities of female participation in a completely thoroughgoing way in the life of the church. Now in the Faith to Grow program there's two elements. There's the growth element and the expansion element. And initially when you talk about developing the skills and the leadership training to enable a large number of women who have not seen that as a role for them in the past, the growth dimension of the Faith to Grow program is really going to come back strongly into focus. I do not think initially that it will make a lot of difference to expansion. I don't think there are a lot of people who will be drawn to our church simply because we've taken that step. But in the long run, it multiplies the number of witnesses and the degree of commitment which now women as well as men will have to share that testimony in their, among their friends. In light of all that's taken place this week and in this, this step in accepting uh, the document as the mind and will of God, what, what's your hope for the future of the church? Well, I've always been very optimistic and uh, very enthused about the church, but I can only say that this makes me even more so. I see a very bright future before the church, and uh, this especially because of the spirit that was present among the people at the conference. When people came, uh, and many, with rather fixed uh, and firm points of view regarding such questions as the ordination of women, for example, and who, in the midst of the ministry of the Holy Spirit at conference, found themselves being altered in their understandings and in their appreciations and their attitudes, uh, they were willing to receive that ministry of the Holy Spirit, to respond to it and to adjust some of their own thinking as a result of that. I'm sure they do not yet have all the questions to that, but to see that occur even among the delegates who had finally to vote for the document, as well as in all of the other participants at conference, the many visitors and so on, was certainly a very encouraging thing to observe and is an ample testimony of the fact that the Spirit of the Lord is with the movement and especially with his people. Our thanks again to each of you for your candidness and willingness to respond to these important questions. Appreciate the opportunity. We hope you've enjoyed part one of Perspectives 84. We'll be looking at some other perspectives of the 1984 World Conference in the second half of our program. We'll talk about the frequency of conference issue. We'll look at some of the new practices at conference this year. We'll discuss the World Church budgets and the Board of Appropriations proposal and examine all other major conference actions. And we'll have a very special story from Australia. Please join us. Welcome to Part 2 of Perspectives 84. I'm Jill Jensen with Terry Reed and Susan Cavanaugh, your hosts for this program. As we told you in Part 1, conference has been an historic week in the life of the church. In Part 2, 
We'll talk about the new practices at conference this year. We'll discuss the World Church Budgets and Board of Appropriations proposal, hear about a successful camp in Australia, and find out when the conference decided to meet again. For a while, it looked like even more history would be made, as the conference considered legislation that would alter the frequency of world conferences from the current pattern of once every two years to once every four years. This legislation, sponsored by the First Presidency on the recommendation of the Conference Organization and Procedures Committee, was introduced out of a concern that biennial meetings represent an increasing cost to the Church, both in financial resources and personnel time. Church leaders and headquarters staff begin fairly intensive planning for the conference a full year before it is convened. Area, national, and regional conferences and other leadership events such as Worship 81 and Pulse were suggested as viable alternatives to the biennial church-wide gatherings. These types of conferences would provide the fellowship building experiences and legislative forums necessary for a growing church. Area conferences currently are practiced in five regions of the church, but all are outside North America. Some delegates supported this rationale for changing conference to every four years, but many others felt World Conference was too important to make it less frequent. Four years is a long time to get the entire body together and come back. I think it's too long a time. I think that everybody likes to stay up on things more. I felt that it was uh, a spiritual experience that you can't receive other than at a World Conference that would be uh, uh, denied a lot of people. Uh, I voted for the four-year conference because I was willing to try that. However, if we are to come to that, that decision doesn't have to be made at this point. So uh, I'm comfortable with it. In light of the new document, maybe the next, for having it for two years is important instead of the four years. And so on Tuesday morning, the conference approved a substitute resolution that provides for the World Conference to meet again in April of 1986, not 88. This action also calls for continued study by the First Presidency on this matter, as well as input from the membership at large. Summaries of those studies and comments are to be published periodically in the Saints Herald, and a report is to be made to the 86th Conference. While we'll still continue our pattern of biennial world conferences, at least for two more years, the prospect of national conferences will continue to emerge in our discussion of this issue. I think we need to get into regional and national conferences too. I feel that the time has come where our church is growing, expanding, that we need to deal with our own issues on our own local level and then come together as a world church and then vote on world issues also. Informed discussion of this important issue was made possible in part by the initiation of hearing committees, one of the new implementations of the 1984 conference. Susan has a report on these and other new procedures. During 1982's World Conference, legislation was approved that resulted in some new practices for this year's conference. Because of the growing number of delegates, the conference was becoming increasingly difficult to manage. So, the entire delegate body was reduced through two resolutions. This year, there were no ex officio members that acted as delegates. A survey conducted by the Conference Organization and Procedures Committee showed respondents favoring the reduction of ex officio members. In the other attempt to reduce the legislative body, 1982 conference voters resolved to restrict the delegate body to 2,800 members. The basis of representation for the chosen 2,800 was also modified by legislation. Previous conference delegates went another step to improve communication between leadership and delegates, as well as among delegations, by passing resolutions that called for the formations of hearing committees and a general delegate caucus. The hearing committees met during the first Saturday and Monday of World Conference. The general purposes of the hearing committees were to encourage wide participation and consensus among the delegates without the restrictions imposed by parliamentary procedure, to refine and possibly consolidate similar resolutions to clarify legislative debate, 
to provide forums to inform the delegates with the expectation of developing broad support for World Church programs and to provide officers and persons with expertise an extended opportunity to present their views and recommendations. The committees met not only in the main conference chamber, but also in three other locations. Response to the institution of the hearing committees was positive. I think it was phenomenal. I think people who would not normally speak on the conference floor were given opportunities here uh, either in an organized manner, some people had their speeches prepared, or in a spur of the moment kind of thing where they could say anything that they wanted to. Yes, it gave opportunity like they've never had opportunity before, like we've never had opportunity. It helps with to understand, people to understand the issues much better, uh, clear knowledge of what deals with them, what will be the results of them, and I think they are a big benefit to the conference this year. The hearing committees were open to general membership, but only delegates had voice. These delegates were restricted by a time limit when they took the floor. An executive staff presided over the hearings. This staff determined in closed session whether they concurred, concurred with modification, or did not concur with the resolution. The proposed legislation was then passed on to the First Presidency, along with the executive staff's recommendation. From that point, the items of business and recommendations were brought before the general delegate body. Delegates met in daily caucus Tuesday through Saturday of conference week. The caucuses were designed to provide legislative forum for delegates who were not members of other quorums, orders, and councils. New legislation was allowed introduction by petitions containing signatures of at least 50 delegates. The First Presidency appointed a chairperson, secretary, and parliamentarian to conduct business. A large screen was used with an overhead projector to aid the presentation of new legislation in the delegate caucuses. Church leaders were pleased at the improvement these new institutions brought to the World Conference of 1984. Apostle Joe Sirig explained that conference committee members were planning to be continually responsive to the changing communication needs of every world conference. The committee feels that its primary role is to continue to sensitize the conference to the need to continually struggle and find ways to make the, the conference as responsive as possible to uh, the needs of the church and the wishes of the delegates, and also to continue to remind uh, the members of the church that the conference should not be seen in isolation from the mission of the church, but rather should be a vehicle to accomplish that mission. We see this conference responding very positively to that challenge. One of the most significant topics of business discussed by the hearing committees was the consideration of the church's multi-million dollar budget, as well as how that budget should be approved. Jill has a report. If you favor the grand total of $16,550,000 for fiscal year 1985, please show your hands. Thank you. Those opposed, we have approved the budget with one amendment. The delegate body voted in an unusual move during Wednesday of conference to raise the budget ceiling for the fiscal years 1985 and 1986. Budget ceilings are calculated according to ties, general offering income, and anticipated economic trends. The Board of Appropriations recommended to the conference grand totals for the general operating fund of more than $16 million for fiscal year 1985 and more than $17 million for fiscal year 1986. After much debate, the legislative body voted to amend elders' expense under the ministerial section, adding $150,000 to 1985's proposed budget and $200,000 for 1986. Alteration of the budget was prompted through discussion of a recommendation to rescind World Conference Resolution 1101 regarding elders' expense in regions and stakes. The recommendation was a result of a declining rate of income to the general fund, making it difficult to adequately support elders' expense reimbursement and other priority programs. It was recommended that Resolution 1101 be rescinded, making field jurisdictions once again responsible for partial support of the appointee ministers in their area. The conference rejected this recommendation, however, because of concern over local budgets. Delegate Alan Smith from the San Diego District provided persuasive speech addressing the problem of funding elders' expense. 
I believe that if we call upon the Saints to make a commitment to this budget, and if we take appropriate steps and launch appropriate strategies, that the Saints will in fact respond and we will be able to support this increase. The budget was approved with one amendment, making the grand totals for the general operating budgets at $16,550,000 and $17,750,000 for fiscal years 85 and 86. Also approved was a reappropriation of funds totaling $81,200 to refurbish the auditorium organ. Discussion concerning the approval process of the budget was heard Monday and Tuesday during the hearing and business sessions. A resolution from the First Presidency to the conference recommended giving the power of budget approval to a reconstituted Board of Appropriations. The resolution called for an expansion of the present Board to include 34 additional members elected from the delegate body by the World Conference, thus increasing the Board membership to 68. The rationale for the resolution was to expedite budget deliberation, leaving conference more time to spend on other issues. A second resolution presented by Santa Fe Stake of Independence called for an expansion of the board by nine elected members from the World Church, rather than 34, with power of approval left to the conference. The body rejected any resolution, leaving the sole approval of the budget to the Board of Appropriations. The conference did vote to elect nine members to serve on the board. Elected representatives must be a church member in good standing, serve a term of four years, and act as advisors with the board in planning a program and budget for recommendation to the World Conference. Bishop Hummel explains the difference between the adopted resolution and the resolution recommended by the First Presidency. C-5, had it been adopted, would have transferred the responsibility for budget approval from the World Conference to the Board of Appropriations. With the adoption of the substitute, the responsibility for approving the budget remains with the World Conference. Also, uh, the adopted substitute removes any reference to the interval of uh, World Conference, whereby C5 and the C6 resolution, which was never considered, both had a relationship to a, an interval of conference. And then finally, the adoption of the substitute does add the nine elected members which had previously not been provided for in the conference re resolutions. In the past, the budget has been presented to the conference using a slideshow presentation. This conference, the budget was presented in a 50-minute video program hosted by two members of the First Presidency and two members of the presiding bishopric. The Electronic Media Commission produced the program. A large screen video projector was rented to show it in the main chamber during Tuesday's afternoon business session. This method of presenting the Church's financial report to the conference was efficient in terms of time and was well accepted by the conference. If you would like to see the 1984 budget presentation, contact the Resource Center at the auditorium. Thanks, Jill. The conference also spent a considerable amount of time discussing some legislative items which concern major social issues in the world today. Abortion, marriage and divorce, and human rights all received a considerable amount of discussion by the conference. A statement by the First Presidency entitled Marriage and Termination of Marriage was approved by the World Conference. This statement affirms the sacredness of the marriage covenant recognizing it as a legal contract and stresses the need for the church to provide ministries to support that covenant. It also acknowledges the necessity in some cases for the termination of the marriage and calls for supportive, non-judgmental ministry from the church. Another sensitive legislative item considered by the conference dealt with the issue of abortion. The resolution called for the 1974 statement by the Standing High Council to become the official position of the Church. After considerable discussion and an amendment attempting to update the 10-year-old statement and provide for cases of rape, the entire matter was referred to the First Presidency for continued guidance to the Church. The subject of human rights is another issue the conference deliberated over with an extreme amount of sensitivity. Delegates were given the opportunity to be registered as absent during discussion of the issue in order that citizens of some countries could not be implicated for any action that might be viewed as subversive. 
The resolution affirms that all persons have essential human rights and encourages the Church and its members to support organizations working on behalf of those whose rights are being violated throughout the world. The conference approved this matter with an amendment calling for an additional focus of child advocacy with the pastoral care office assuming that function. An appropriate division of the World Church will be assigned the task of informing the membership on universal human rights and human rights violations. Legislation concerning the sacrament of the Lord's Supper was introduced to the World Conference, although never considered on the legislative floor. The British Columbia District had approved a resolution promoting open communion, but a motion of objection to consideration was upheld by the delegates, and any action on the issue was prevented. The sensitive nature of the inspired document was the rationale used in calling for the referral of several proposed rules of order changes, which would have significantly affected the World Church field organizational structure. The conference agreed with that assessment and referred the matter to the First Presidency in consultation with the Council of Twelve with an expected recommendation to the 1986 conference. One of the traditional items on the conference week's agenda is the selection of the Graceland College Board of Trustees. Byron P. Constance of Independence, Missouri, William H. Kelly of Ames, Iowa, and Gretchen A. Bowes of Independence were elected by the conference to fill the three vacancies on the board. As we mentioned earlier, conference is always a time when the ministry of several persons is redefined by the sacrament of ordination. This year the list included Jeffrey F. Spencer to the office of Apostle, filling the vacancy left by Charles D. Neff in compliance with the inspired document. Paul M. Edwards was called and ordained to serve as the president of the Quorum of High Priest. Richard W. Hawks was ordained president of 70 and will lead the fifth quorum. And Apostle Paul W. Booth was ordained to president of the Council of Twelve. Many people who come to conference come bearing testimonies of how the church is succeeding in other parts of the world. From Australia, Vera Entwistle comes and shares her story of camp quality. A couple of years ago, Vera was reading a magazine article about a camp for children who had cancer. She was so moved by the article, she decided to organize such a camp in Australia. Through her efforts and the help of the community, Vera saw her dream come true. Susan visited with Vera about the camp. Vera, why a camp quality in the first place? Well, as you know, camp quality is for children who have all phases of cancer. And one of the things that has been the biggest surprise and the biggest shock for me are the numbers of children who are coping with cancer. In one hospital alone in Sydney, there are 400 children being treated for cancer right now. And so all of these children, what we're finding, have a need for a support group, not only for them, but also for their families too, because their length of treatment is very long the kinds of treatment that they have to be subjected to are very painful. And the um, energy level of the children fluctuates so much that the very idea of being a child and having childhood times and playing and having the kind of fun that children should have is usually something that they're not able to have. And one of the things that we wanted to do was give them a week of fun so that they could be children again. We tried to pack into the camp all the kinds of activities that they would really get excited about. But we also wanted to provide a week of rest for their families so that some of those parents could take a much needed break, knowing that their children were at a camp that was staffed not only by medical personnel who could take care of their medical needs, but also youth campers and staff members who would make sure that they had a week of fun. So what has the response of both the children, the parents, or rather, all of the children, the parents, and the public as well been to Camp Quality. Just tremendous. I, I wish we really had time to tell all of it. But we have a uh, file full of letters from parents of children expressing their appreciation. We have a lot of excited children now looking forward to our next camp. We have hundreds, literally hundreds, of community groups who've come forward to help us. We have a hospital staff who are encouraging us and supporting us to keep the program going. And of course, we do keep contact with the children after camp. 
we have a monthly newsletter that goes out to tell them everything that's being planned for the next camp, to give them hope, to give them something to look forward to. Because of the success of Camp Quality, what are your dreams and your hopes for seeing more camps of this kind constructed in other areas of the world? Oh, I have big dreams for Camp Quality. I would like to see it go worldwide. We have four camps in Australia for 1984. We have one in New Zealand for 1985, a possibility of one in England for 85, and then a couple of states here in America have talked to me about having camps too. I would love to see this go worldwide. Vera, you have a very special story that you'd like to share with us. Well, yes, I do. It's uh, about a little girl, seven years old, who was one of our first campers, who came to me one evening and asked if she might ask me a special question. And her question was, if I felt that Jesus knew when she hurt. And I said, yes, not only do I think that, that he knows when you hurt, but I think he hurts too. And then I worried that I couldn't think of anything more constructive or, or further to say. The next day when I saw her, I said, what would you really like to do today? And she said, I've never ridden a horse. So I took her over to the paddock and we found a horse just the right size and she galloped off with some friends. Later on that day, she came running back across the field to me, all excited because she'd ridden this horse. And I said, now where are you going? And she said, oh, I'm, I'm going to go try abseiling. And so I said, okay, great, on your way. And she started to run across to where the, the class was gathering. And she stopped and turned and shouted my name. And I turned and said, yes. And she said to me, do you think heaven will be like this? And that story really capsulizes for me the worthwhileness of this kind of a program that we might show children that not only do we care, but that they have a heavenly father who cares because there are times when they doubt that. It's a story like Vera Antwistle's that really provides the fiber for that special quality of unity and fellowship that we celebrate at World Conference. Everyone at World Conference, both young and old, has some kind of testimony to share and a contribution to make. There are countless stories like Vera's, stories that really represent the purpose of our gathering. Conference gives new meaning to our mission in the world and challenges us in new ways to live out our Christian witness. As you can imagine, it's been difficult to squeeze all the elements of World Conference into one hour, especially this 1984 conference. But hopefully you've been able to feel a little of the spirit that we've shared here and be challenged and renewed by that spirit. Thank you for being with us. What has Conference of 1984 meant to you? Well, you know, this is my fifth conference in a row that I've been here. And I'm really surprised because, you know, after the vote on the revelation, I thought everybody would be scattering. But I've looked upstairs and looked down and I've noticed that people are still around. And I'm really impressed that there is, there are a lot of people who believe in our prophet and God. Personally, it's, it's really expanded my view about the church and it's really it's really meant a lot to me. It's been a spiritual strengthening. The 1984 conference uh, is uh, very special for me. I was not expecting the kind of spirit that I can feel uh, before coming. It's been a landmark and uh, it's certainly historic and I'm glad I was here. I think overall it's been excellent. Since I was a child, it's been a dream of mine to come to a world conference of the church. This is uh, our first occasion. Our two daughters are with us, and we have had just a marvelous experience. I hope, by through God's grace, I will share in the next conference. Thank you very much. Dear saints, have courage for the task which is yours in bringing to pass the cause of Zion. 
prepare yourselves through much study and earnest prayer. Then as you go forth to witness of my love and my concern for all persons, you will know the joy which comes from devoting yourselves completely to the work of the kingdom. To this end will my spirit be with you. Amen. <laughs>